of it, I think it kind of changes your whole outlook on your job and what you do. Absolutely. Anna, who? Anna, Tanya, and Angelina. Angelina, I don't know how old she is and it doesn't matter, but she works here about 40 hours a week. She also has another job. What? She works 30 hours a week. What? Wow. That's amazing. She works like 70, 75 yeah, hours a week. Tell these little servers. Europeans aren't. She says, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to go sit at home. What am I going to do? Keep you active. Yep. So let's just touch on a few things. I know we're running short on time, but you know, it's all about building the brand. It's all about having an understanding of who we are and what we do. Calamari, we all know that we clean it in-house. Why is that important? It's important because you have to tell the story. We are the largest purchaser of whole squid, ultimately in the entire Midwest, probably the side of the Mississippi. We have a relationship with Town Dock Squid Fisheries off the coast of Rhode Island. They are a third generation family of fishermen that source our calamari, calamari for us from the Atlantic, which is the eastern seaboard of the United States, if you didn't know that. It is product of the USA, caught by American fishermen in American boats. Why is that important? Go, go look on Google and see what a Chinese fishing boat looks like. Look at what an American fishing boat looks like. We're licensed, we're regulated, we're sanctioned, we're insured, we're bonded, we pay fair wages, we are responsible to the federal government for overfishing. We're responsible to the government on how we fish, diesel chemical fuel emissions on boats, making sure that you're only fishing in certain areas, you're not destroying other species of fish in the ocean or the ocean in itself. You're not dumping your sewer and your toilet into the ocean. You know, you don't discard things into the ocean. Everything's governed, ruled, and sanctioned at the end of the day. Our rules, regulations, and guidelines are more strict and of higher quality and standard than anywhere in the world. So that's important. And then our workers make a fair wage, that's important too. So why is that important that we have a source for calamari? Calamari that most 99% of the restaurants and hey, everything has a place in this world. I don't shun anybody or any, anything. Because everybody in the world serves calamari now. You can get calamari probably at the, you know, the high school lunch line anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm being real. But we buy whole squid that we clean, no chemicals, no bleach, no salt, no preservatives. So it has an all-natural, fresh, clean tenderness that's unparalleled. So we all know part A, when we clean our squid in-house. We clean the calamari in-house. But if I know anything about food, I'm going to go, why, is it dirty? I mean, it doesn't really sound appetizing. Well, we clean it in-house. Would butcher be a better process? Yeah. Butcher, yeah. fabricate. I say we prepare. Prepare? Yeah. Right. I like all of those. Bring it home. Clean is not dirty. Right. But in culinary terms, we call it dirty squid because it still has the ink sacs attached to it. But it's the reason why we do it, all natural, no chemicals, chemicals, no preservatives, no added salt, no preservatives. It's in its fresh, all natural, unadulterated state. We had a restaurant consultant that came in a few years ago, you guys might have seen him or known him. You know, he changed the menus and changed some recipes and... Brought in fails. What's that? Brought in the fails for our bread and our Yeah. And you know, he was trying to help modernize on Diablo and get us into the, you know, the next century, I guess, if you will, and was going to do some things. And one of the things that he brought to Joe and Rosalie was buying squid that's already done, pre-cleaned, pre-prepared, so you guys will save a ton of labor. You know, you got to make these restaurants more profitable, you got to save labor, you got to save labor, you got to save labor. I fought it. I said, no, we're not doing it. I'm not doing it. And I ended up losing the battle. I just, I, I got too many other fights out there. If this, you know. I can only tell you what I can tell you. You hire me to represent you and represent your brand, it's the wrong thing to do for this company. He convinced them to go with it. We did it for about three months. And I luckily was able to get it back to buying the squid that we were buying. And not that I want you to go out and tout this, but this is an important story because people were coming and eating the calamari and it was like, okay, well, you know, we're not getting any complaints on it. 
I said, well, then if that's how you're going to judge it, then I'm working for the wrong place. That's right. You know? Here you go. Take my keys. People used to come in here, eat our calamari, and go, wow, that was great. That's the best calamari I've ever had. And guess what? They stopped talking about it. Mm. They weren't complaining about it, but they just stopped talking about it. That's a problem. We got to get them talking about everything that we're doing. So we've been back to using it for over a year now, but it's important. And everything on our menu, if you look at all these advertisers, I can tell you a 20 minute story about each, or 10 minute story about each and every one. Supli a la telefono. I think on the menu it says supli a la andiamo. But we usually call them supli a la telefono. You know why? Because when Chef Aldo was a little kid, when they used to eat them at home, they'd pull them apart and the cheese would stretch out of them. The kids, you know how kids are, they used to play and then, you know, whoever could stretch theirs the longest was the winner or whatever. They said it used to look like telephone wire, like lines of telephone wire. That was a big thing. When he was a kid growing up in the 40s, there was a world with no electrical, no telephones, and all of a sudden they started putting up electrical posts and telephone wires in Italy. That was a big deal. I mean, as a kid, like, holy cow, you're living through this, like, industrial revolution. So they used to pull them apart, and they would stretch like telephone wire. And that's a cool little story. Our original corporate chef from Italy. I mean, that's why we call them Supli a la Telefono. Portobello mushrooms, one of our best-selling appetizers. Because the mushrooms have a very firm, meaty, dense, meat-like texture to them. That we prepare them just like a steak. We marinate them and char grill them just like we would one of our finest cuts of steak or chop. And we do the same thing. We bury it with our rich, buttery au jus, just like a steak. That's how you describe a portobello mushroom. Chef's hand feel. Mm -hmm. Peppers and sauces, I mean, it's not maybe as popular as it used to be or as popular as like, um, you know, it is in other areas. Like in Vegas, I sell a ton of it. Love it. An absolute ton of it. How many women like peppers and sausage? How many women don't like it because it's, it's too spicy? Too spicy. I was waiting for someone to say that, but the reason it's spicy is because you're not supposed to eat the peppers by themselves. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, your four taste buds. Hungarian banana peppers are spicy. They're meant to be spicy. You're not supposed to just sit there and eat banana pepper. What do we say kills heat? Fast. Fast. What's Italian sausage? Fast. What else kills heat? Sweet. Sweet. What kind of sauce goes on those peppers and sausage? Sweet tomato sauce. Ah, uh, spicy pepper, fatty sausage, sweet tomato sauce. Eat it together. Mm, yum. Now you got some. <laughs> you eat plain peppers by themselves. Not so good. They're still good, sir. Yes, Soups they and are. salads. <laughs> Spoken from the Hispanic. <laughs> we don't eat a lot of peppers in Germany. Sorry. <laughs> But um, soups and sauces, or salads, I mean, but soups. What makes our soup special? You taste it. We even talk about our minestrone and pasta fagioli. Homemade. Uh, we put our homemade sausage in the pasta fagioli. Right. So pasta fagioli. Beautiful, rustic, Italian, white bean, vegetable soup. The, the star of the soup is our house-made Italian sausage. Like we talked about with the rigatoni Giuseppe, chef caramelizes all the Italian sausage. He's got a beautiful blend of all different types of root vegetables, carrots, onions, celery, a little bit of garlic, the herbs and the spices. You know, it's all sauteed together. We add some San Marzano tomatoes to it to bring out the natural sweetness. The soup is finished with white beans and a fresh brodo or broth. I mean, that's how you sell the soup. The minestrone is a true, classic, rustic, Italian-style minestrone that Aldo has had in his family for decades. I mean, that, the minestrone recipe is probably 80 years old. It's a very rustic, Italian-style vegetable soup. So just knowing what's in it so that you can describe it eloquently and intelligently. We're going to skip over salads because I want to focus on a few more of the important things. Beef. What do we know about our beef program? You don't have to answer. I'm just going to keep talking because I don't want to. I want to try to maximize the time. The beef that we buy grades out in the top eight percent of all beef graded in the United States. Maybe you don't know it. Every piece of meat that gets cut 
and butchered in the United States has to be governed by the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Every butcher shop, every meat processing facility has a government official or employee on their premises all hours of operation that they're fabricating and cutting and butchering. By law. They grade, they inspect, and they make sure that they're following all the guidelines, legislation, and everything that goes into that. The most important thing that goes with it is they value and grade the quality of the beef. How is that done? Generally by looking at the marbling. What is the marbling of a steak? As you cut into a muscle, you can look at the abundant marbling, which I think we've got some pictures of that on here, don't we? To coincide with this? Yes. Ah, yes. Marbling, minuscule intermuscular fat that runs through the muscle. What happens to fat when it gets hot? It melts. Melts. It melts. So when you cook a steak, the fat inside the steak melts. You cut the steak, you eat it, it's heaven. But it's important that you don't want that fat to run out of the steak as it's cooking. That's why you have special broilers in all of your locations. Specialized broilers meant to char seal, lock all the juices inside that steak when it cooks. So even though the steak is rare, it's still nice and heavily charred on the outside to make sure we lock and seal all those juices in the steak. So here's a grade of prime. We start getting into choice, select, standard. You can see the amount of marbling. This almost looks like a pure, just massive red muscle, right? Almost no intermuscular fat. So as that steak cooks, how moist is it going to be? It's going to eat like sawdust. So the problem is, I try to buy steaks that are here. Highly abundant marbling. USDA Prime is the top grade of beef in the United States. Meaning it has highly abundant marbling. But unfortunately, only 2% of beef that grades out in the United States falls into that category. 2% on average. It's not a lot. A lot of steakhouses are very proud and they use that as their calling card. We feature all USDA Prime steak. That's great. It really truly is great. It grades out. It's the best grade in the beef. Problem is, 2% on average, it's not always readily available. This has been the fifth hottest summer on record. You guys heard that on the news? Well, take it. I'm selling it, you're buying it. Fifth hottest summer on record. So what do you think is going on with all those steer in Iowa, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming? Hot, hot summer. They're sweating. They're not getting real fatty. They're not getting real healthy. It's been a drought all through the Midwest. So how much excellent, highly marbled beef do you think I'm going to be producing here come January, February, and March when these animals go to slaughter? Slim. Maybe even 0% on average. Or less than 1%. So that becomes a problem. So here's, here's what I'm trying to explain to you in a nutshell. That if you want to serve USDA Prime steaks, you buy all the USDA Prime when it's available. Butcher shop brings it in, goes to, goes to slaughter, inspector grades it, boom, this is USDA Prime. It all gets cut, packaged, put in the baggies, put in the freezer, so that you have it for use throughout the whole year. We can't always promise that all these steer that are gonna come in are gonna grade out into the prime category. So when they are, you gotta take it while you can, you gotta you know, save your pennies for a rainy day. We don't do business like that. I wanna age my steaks in house, I wanna butcher my steaks in house because I trust that our chefs and our business model is better than any other butcher shop anywhere in the country. So for me, to buy whole mussels, age them in house or butcher them in house, I can't have USDA Prime because it's not readily available throughout the year. So I have to drop down to the top 8%. So I'm using all Prime and I'm using only the next 6% just below Prime. Still highly abundant marbling, but not high enough to grade out to be USDA Prime. Stockyard Premium Angus. Top 8% of all beef in the United States, yes. On, on the age of the steak, how is it done? So that's what we're talking about next. So okay, all right. it's just like our tomato. I'm gonna specify that I want black Angus steer. Best steer for steaks. 
Now I'm going to raise those steer somewhere in the Midwest where I get as much marbling by having good temperate climate. Too hot down south, too cold up north. I want to be somewhere in the central plains. Moderate climate. I'm going to make sure they grade out in the top 8%. So now I've identified it, I've sourced it, I'm going to buy it. And now when I buy it, I want to make sure that it's aged for a minimum of 30 days. Beef is probably the only protein, there's a few random ones, but beef is primarily the only protein that you want to have age on it before you eat it. Chicken, you walk out in the yard, grab a chicken, you wring its neck, you bring it in, you feather it, you cook it, you eat it. It's at its best. Fish, yank it off the boat, bring it in, you cook it right there. The fresher the better. Beef, zero, 100% opposite. As meat ages, the natural enzymes in the muscles break down the muscle tissues and the fibers and they naturally tenderize itself. For the first 15 days, you get almost zero enzyme reaction on the meat. Day 15 to 20, it starts to rise and it plateaus around day 30. Day 30 to 40, you get minimal tenderization in that process. The enzymes have done their work. They've naturally tenderized the meat. By day 30, it's pretty much optimal time. There's not a lot of benefit between day 31 and day 40. Scientific studies. We mandate that all of our beef has a minimum of 30 days of age on it before we even think about butchering it and putting it into service. Yes? So, I've seen meat age where it's, it's out, out in the open and sometimes they age it right in the bag that it comes in. Generally whole muscles that have a bone, we age outside of the bag. Generally muscles that are boneless like filet mignon are aged in the bag, like a cryovac bag where we flush out the oxygen, we fill the bag with nitrogen to eliminate bacterial growth so that we can age it safely for 30 days. It depends on the cut of meat ultimately. Here's the difference, aging done in a bag, aging done out of a cryovac bag. Same enzyme, same chemical reaction, same tenderness, everything's going to be exactly the same except what we call wet aging, meaning it's done inside of a cryovac sealed bag, versus dry aging, which is done outside of a bag in the open air. Same exact tenderization, the difference is when you dry age, you get moisture, evaporation, and loss. And you have to trim it too, don't you? And you have to trim off the age, so it costs you a lot of money. If I start aging a piece of meat outside of the bag, let's say it weighs 20 pounds, when I go back to that 30 days later, it probably only weighs 18 and a half pounds. Because water is evaporated from it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. It's a great thing. <laughs> meat has a specific water content of 65%. The juiciness from a steak doesn't come from the water that's in it. It comes from the fat that's in it. So if I can reduce that water from 65% down to 60 and concentrate the flavors, it's like reducing soup down. I'm going to concentrate the flavors, so that's a good thing. So now I'm down to 18 and a half pounds. So I'm going to have a much better tasting steak, but it's costing me a lot more money now because a pound and a half is now floating around in the cooler. And then I have to trim off all of the bacteria now that's growing on the outside of that steak. Bacteria grows on the exterior and works its way to the interior. Picture a piece of cheese in your refrigerator. Where's the mold on it? Outside. On the outside. You cut off the mold and you eat it. You open a loaf of bread on top of the fridge, you make yourself a PB and j and the two slices on the outside are moldy, right? Yeah, you take one more, you throw it away and eat the next couple, right? <laughs> no. That's why you yeah, have a strong immune system. <laughs> So that's the point. Dry age, wet age. Dry aging, it's not for everybody because what happens is the meat starts to take on a very earthy, a very intense, very depth, a very in-depth flavor. I'll give you a story. I was in Chicago maybe 10 years ago for the restaurant show in Chicago. It's like the biggest show in the country. Chefs travel all over the world to go there. I went out for dinner. One of our vendors took us out to dinner. I got to choose the restaurant. The guy's famous for 45 to 60 day dry aged steaks. Great place in Chicago. This closed down like six months ago. But um, 
We went there, so here I am with a vendor and eight other chefs. There might have been 10 of us at the table. I ordered a 60 day dry aged ribeye. It was like a 32 ounce long bone, dry aged 60 day ribeye for the table, you know what I mean? It came out, you could just smell it. I mean, it like smelled almost like fungal. It smelled like truffle and mushroom and the earth, like forest floor. I mean, it was divine. Everybody took a little bite and he's like, oh, I don't want to eat that. It's too intense. So I got to eat the whole steak myself. Awesome. <laughs> and this is chefs. I mean, and they were like, it's, it's too intense for me. So it's not for everybody. But minimum 30 days of age promotes extreme tenderness inside the meat. All of our boning products, we wet age them from the supplier for 30 days. And then those of your stores that have band saws in the kitchen, they come in for 30 days, we cut them out of the bag, we age them for another seven to 10 days, and then we put them on the band saw and we'll start cutting steaks. So optimum tenderization, maximum flavor, grades out the top 8%. And I will promise you, I'll even challenge any chef in town. I can buy a low grade quality steak like this, let me age it for 45 days. You buy the best steak, I'll let you age it for a week. Put these two on a side-by-side -side taste test, I bet I win. That's how important aging, what a factor it plays in beef. When you buy a USDA Prime, you have no idea. You bring a thousand head of steer in for processing, 20 of them might make the grade, 90 of them might make the grade, and one of them might make the grade. You don't know. So when they start making the grade, when you get 90 head to come in and they grade out prime, those butchers are all over it. As quick as they can get it processed and packaged, generally it goes right into the freezer. How much of that enzyme tenderization goes on when the meat's in the freezer? Zero. Marginal compared to in the refrigerator. I, had a, I did this training too, and one of the managers said, you know, he goes, he goes, chef, I'm completely blown away. He said, I used to work at a steakhouse. He goes, and you know, the only steaks that ever got complaints on were our USDA prime steaks. He goes, which was our signature steaks? He goes, I never got a complaint on any other steaks on our menu, but I repetitively got complaints on our USDA prime steaks that they were tough and they were dry. I said, you're exactly right. That's why I don't buy Prime. Because Prime gets cut, it gets butchered, it gets packaged, and it gets put in the freezer so that it's there for those state houses to use it throughout the year as they need it. There's no guarantee if it had one day or 40 days of age before it went into that freezer. And when you freeze things that have 65% water content in there, what happens to the water when it freezes? It expands. It expands. The muscle tissues and the fibers can't retain all of that expansion. It ruptures the muscle fibers and the tissues, not tenderizes them, it ruptures them and destroys them. It's like millions of little microscopic rubber bands and they all just stretched and broke. So now you thaw this steak out, all the rubber band structure is broken. Now you thaw out those frozen ice crystals, what happens? You got a big pile of red water in your bag. The steak can't retain its own natural moisture anymore. Which is okay, because I don't want a lot of water in there. But now when I go to cook it, I can't sear it and char it and lock the juice in anymore because all the tissues have been ruptured. So it doesn't eat juicy anymore. This is like a two hour seminar that we just had in 15 minutes on beef. I've traveled beef processing plants all over the country. I've been to slaughterhouses, I process animals all the time. It's a fascinating, fascinating world. It's not for everybody, but again, if I were the marketing guy, I want my commercial with me, with a big side of me at the bandsaw. You're watching the six o'clock news and here's me at the bandsaw, blood's flying everywhere, <laughs> meat, tissue, and bone scraps, and you can hear the saw like, as you're cutting through bone. Hell yes. <laughs> but that's not probably for everybody, you know? People don't want to know where their steak comes. They just want a nice, Right? They just want a nice steak on their plate. 
Or you could be like me and never had a stick in your life. No. <laughs> so let's just talk a little bit more here before I run out of time because this is really important. Of all the steaks that we serve on our menu, our steaks only come from this dotted line to this dotted line. What steaks come from the rib section? Ribeyes or prime rib. What comes from the short line? New York strips and the tenderloin. The tenderloin runs on the inside of the rib cage, not the outside. All the other muscles are on the outside of the rib cage. This runs inside the rib cage. So when you split an animal, you break his ribs, hacksaw through his ribs and split him open. You viscerate him and pull out all of his intestines, his lungs, and all of the viscera. There's two beautiful tender straps of meat inside the rib cage called the tenderloins. Why does everybody like beef tenderloin? It's the softest, leanest, most tender cut on the entire animal because the muscle is not used ever. It's inside the ribs. It's never exercised. How much marbling is in a muscle that's never exercised? Almost none. You cut a fillet and it looks almost red, just like that picture in the bottom right corner all the way through. But that's okay. Fillet doesn't have a meaty, rich, heavy steak flavor. But everybody loves it because you can cut it with a fork. It's so tender and cute. <laughs> That's why it's perfect with our zip sauce. Lean, and you drown it with this rich, buttery au jus. Now you've got a marriage made in heaven. I don't like filet, personally. It's our number one selling item at most of our restaurants. I'll eat it, but I wouldn't really work, walk past John Rodriguez to go eat one. It has no flavor. It's like you put it on your palate, you chew it, and it just... It's like macaroni and cheese when you're a kid, you know? It just like macerates on your palate. There's no texture to it. It doesn't have a lot of meat flavor. But that's okay. My wife, it's all she'll eat. I could bring her home a 45-day dry-aged ribeye sample that I got from a vendor, put it on the grill, cook it. Oh, I'm like, I'm drooling, like bringing it to the table. She's like, should have had a filet. <laughs> you know? God love her. Opposites attract, I guess, right? So how much, uh, picture this animal walking. Obviously, it uses a ton of this. It uses a ton of this. And it uses a ton of muscles all through here. The muscles in this midsection of this animal are very rarely used. How often does a steer turn in its torso? I mean, never, right? So we choose the, the steaks that we feature on our menu come from this section of the animal only because they're not a very heavily exercised. But the animal does walk. It gets a lot of movement. I mean, just when I walk and I move my front and back legs, I get a lot of muscle development all through here as I turn and walk, but not a tremendous amount. So this is all very tough meat. This is all very tough meat. So we choose New York strips, ribeyes, and tenderloins as our meats. You all don't have all three of those on your menu, but the New York strip is a great item. I think it has some of the most abundant marbling of all the steaks. I think it has a lot of the true steak flavor. Great marbling, but it has a little bit more of a mouthfeel to it. It's got more texture to it. There's some more developed muscle outside of the rib cage. The ribeye steak is kind of a cross right in between. It's got the full flavor of the New York strip, but it's got the tenderness of the filet mignon. So we kind of call the ribeye the king of steaks. So as you're walking people through your menu and you're talking about the different steaks on your menu, what kind of steak do you enjoy? Most people love our filet mignon because it's extremely soft, lean, and tender. You can cut it with a fork, and it pairs beautifully with our rich, buttery au jus. As a matter of fact, it's our number one selling item across all of our locations, including our award-winning steakhouse in Las Vegas. If I'm sitting at your table and you gave me that, holy shit, I'm blown away. That's awesome. Then you say, or oh, I could offer you a New York strip. Steak has great texture to it. Abundant marbling, it's going to have a rich, real, meaty, steak-like flavor to it. 
you know, as you're cutting through it with the steak knife. I'm not going to say that it's tougher or it's chewier or whatever I'm going to say, but as you're cutting through it with your steak knife and fork and eating it, so I'm already letting them know, you know what I'm saying? I'm painting a picture in their mind of what they're getting into. Or we also feature a ribeye, which is generally everybody's, you know, the king, of, everybody generally recognizes it as the king of all steaks or the favorite because it features tenderness more similar to the filet mignon, but also the rich, meaty flavors of the New York strip, but a little bit more tender. So I'm describing the New York strip as being tougher without ever saying it. By making the parallels and painting the picture, you see how that works? By talking about cutting it with a steak knife, by saying that the ribeye is going to have the same great flavors as the New York strip, but it's going to eat a little bit more tender. I'm already letting them know what they're in for without saying it and doing it. That's how you sell steaks. And you got a question? Yeah. Tenderloin. Beef tenderloin medallions. See how that tenderloin is shaped? This is the perfect picture. That's almost how a tenderloin looks kind of in layman's terms. So guess what? I can't cut an eight ounce steak off of that tip. As Buddy alluded to earlier, we serve beef tenderloin tips because I can't cut a steak out of that cone shaped part. As I start getting into this section here, the, the circumference, is about like this. The diameter, you know, across might only be like two or three inches. So if I were to cut an eight ounce fillet, it would be about this big around, but it would be this tall. You know, I'm gonna have to put it on the grill and step on it to try to cook it, so it doesn't work. So that's why we cut medallions. So I can cut nice, beautiful medallions out of that section, and then I get to here, ah, boom. Now I can cut nice, two inch thick, eight ounce fillets, and your 10 ounces, your 12 ounces. We got a guy at Joe Mir Bloomfield, he sells 20 to 40 ounce fillet, like Chateau Grill. <laughs> and he carves the table side all the time. It's like his <laughs> shit. But he's so confident with the meat, he's so confident with the quality, that he sells it to everybody. Is it okay to sell 16 over, 16 ounces? We were chef told the it, chef? We were told it wasn't. Check with your chef. I mean, I, so, I sold them an 80 ounce there a couple weeks ago. I go, I can't go any bigger because my meat was all trimmed. I mean, I took a little bit of the tip off and I was like, the best I can do is like 80 ounces. He's like, I'll, I'll, let me go see. He went and sold it to the table. $25 an ounce. There you go. How'd they cook it? Medium? Medium rare? Medium. <coughs> It was a table of 12. Anyone who's interested, uh, Barry Sanders eats 40 ounces of steak every time we came to MGM. Yeah. So. 40? 40 ounces of steak. So look at that. I guess I should have gotten to this slide when I was talking about it. Here's your ribeye steak. Here's your New York strip steak. There's your filet mignon. Look at that. Nice work, Walter. <laughs> So when someone does, when I go through my steak progression and I demonstrate everything to you, I'm going to go to you and say, oh, wonderful, you're going to have the filet mignon. How would you like that prepared? Oh, I like mine well done. Well done. Wonderful. It's going to have a beautiful charred, uh, heavily, you know, caramelized exterior, and it will be hot, brown center all the way throughout the steak. Is that going to be cooked to your liking? Yes. yes. Very good. That's a good way to describe it because not everyone likes their meat rare. No, Absolutely right. Hey, Chef, would you like them to, if it's any from, from medium well or well done, that they ask if it's butterfly, or do you not want them to ask that question? I'm okay with that. I mean, and then secondly, because, I mean, obviously, if it is well done, if you leave it on the char grill for a while, there is obviously going to be char. You have people say that has too much char. Right. So is it wrong to then also ask them if they enjoy char, because they could obviously finish it in the oven so that it doesn't completely char. I, that's why I confirmed well, that. It's gonna, I, just, I think I said in my descriptive where I said it, I said it's going to have a very heavily 
charred, caramelized exterior. <coughs> then perfect, you know? Or if they say, oh no, I don't like it charred on the outside, then say, could I then I use that's a read your customer. Well, can I offer it to you butterfly then so that I can present it to you with that fully cooked center without the char on the outside? And it's just kind of knowing your clientele and knowing your customer. And then I'm going to look at you because you're at the table too and I'm going to say, how do you like your steak prepared? Medium rare. Medium rare, but let's just pretend that medium rare to him means pink all the way through because nobody, not everybody knows our culinary terminology. So I'm going to look at him and say, ah, oh, medium rare, that's wonderful. Chef will put a, a nice char on the outside of that to help lock and seal those juices in. And it's going to have about a 50% very cool to warm red center. Is that cooked to your liking? But in his mind, he's thinking he ordered pink. So when I hear cool, cool and red, now he's going to say, no, no, I wanted that. I want it pink all the way through. So what do I say? She said, that's medium. So I would never embarrass him in front of his friends, you know? I would just, I would just write down, me. I'd say, wonderful. And then I would just write down medium and go on. I'm not going to say, well, that's medium. <laughs> and for you, my dear, you know? But we do that a lot. We don't know that we do, but we do that. It happens. It, it's a slip. Because your, your brain's thinking medium, but you just pull it out and say it. Or someone says Merlot, you just want to say, no, it's Merlot. Right? I'll have the clock calamari. Oh, it's calamari. Right. It happens. We just have to train our brains not to do that. Yes. Right. So next is our field. I know we got to run. Do I have five minutes? Ten minutes? Of course you do. If anybody has to go, I get it. If you have to work, you have to go, and you got to go. I'm sorry. From now on, we got to set a timer. I'm only allowed five minutes on each section. But our veal, we're very proud.